Hello. Welcome everyone to today's Knowledge is Great lecture, Celebrage, Celebrating Aging. I'm Sarah and I'm the Director of Arts and Creative Industries at the British Council in Singapore. The Knowledge is Great lecture series is held monthly and showcases the UK's creativity and innovation with leading UK specialists with the aim of bringing people together and exchanging knowledge. We are fortunate to have the British High Commissioner to Singapore with us today, and it is therefore now my great pleasure to introduce Her Excellency Ms. Cara Owen to give the opening address. Your Excellency, we look forward to hearing from you, so handing over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah, and welcome to everybody who is tuned in, uh, be you in Singapore, be you in the UK, be wherever you are sitting um, to talk about uh, this issue around ageing. Um, the great lectures, I've really enjoyed this series during the course of this year. Um, we have tried uh, always to identify issues that are of real interest to both the UK and to Singapore. Uh, many of those are um, issues that we're talking about in countries where we work all over the region or even indeed all over the world. We started off with a real focus around climate change and environmental sustainability, which feels very relevant given that we have got COP uh, starting uh, in just a few days time in Glasgow. But we've also talked about things like the online gig economy, autonomous vehicles, uh, cyber security and others. If you've missed any of these lectures and you'd like to go back and see what um, how they went, uh, there are recordings on the Knowledge is Great webpage. Today we're going to be talking about healthy ageing. Um, I mean, of course, so many governments, particularly those in the developed world, are um, have an increasing focus on how we are going to manage uh, uh, both the challenges and the opportunities presented by an ageing population. According to the Office of National Statistics in the UK, the population of the UK is projected to pass 70 million by mid-2031, reaching 72 and a half million by mid-2043. And the elderly population will grow amongst that. In mid-2018, there were 1.6 million people aged 85 years and over in the UK. By mid-2043, this is projected to nearly double to 3 million. In Singapore, 14% of the population today are aged 65% and above, but by 2030, so in only nine years' time, that is projected to increase to 25% of the population. And in many countries, we are likely to see a growing sandwich generation or even a double sandwich uh, generation, uh, which means that people are in their 60s, who have to care for their own living parents, uh, but also potentially a grandchild so that their own adult children uh, can work. The Office of National Statistics in the UK estimates that people in their 50s and early 60s are more likely than any other age group to be juggling caring responsibilities and work. So it's really important for all societies, uh, for individual members, for governments, for population, for um, policy makers, to think about how we can make sure that those older populations remain active, productive, independent, socially connected and happy across generations for as long as possible. And there is a huge amount that we can learn from each other given how much um, research uh, and innovation effort we are putting into these questions and how much policy official thinking time we are devoting to them. Um, there's lots of different ways in which we can exchange information. Um, in March this year, our Department for International Trade organised a webinar bringing together speakers from the UK's National Health Service and the National Innovation Centre for Ageing and from Singapore's Ministry of Health Ageing Planning Office and the Agency for Integrated Care. The discussion focused on the shared challenges and initiatives in the UK and Singapore to enable active and independent lives for older people. Um, the UK, like Singapore, seeks to harness all of the strengths that we've got, integrated strengths from academia, also from our integrated health services. And we're very lucky that we have 
very well integrated um, kind of research, caregiving, data collecting organizations in both countries to develop um, innovative solutions for healthy aging. Our UK research and innovation through the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund is supporting businesses, including social enterprises, to provide the products and services that people want and need to enable their own healthy aging. They're invest investing over 98 million pounds towards uh, tackling these questions. And here in Singapore, we've had a national blueprint um, since 2015, the Action Plan for Successful Aging. Um, and that's one way in which Singapore aims to achieve the outcome of healthy aging within its community. Um, the plan encompasses a system of proactive outreach, preventive health and active aging programmes for seniors in every neighbourhood. Uh, I've heard my Singaporean friends talk passionately about healthy ageing in place. When I first heard of the topic and who was going to be speaking, it really, really resonated with me. This isn't just because this year I've passed a major milestone uh, in my own life in a way that makes me um, start thinking about what my own aging is going to feel like. Uh, and I've started confronting some of those physical changes uh, that we all uh, have to integrate into the way that we run our lives. But I've also accompanied my own parents as they, as they have adjusted to changes to their own physicality, uh, sometimes to health issues, but also to their role in the world, their role in the working place, their role within the family. So I think for all of us, it feels really, really personal. And too often, um, I think we, we see that there is a tendency to focus on some of the negatives or some of the challenges around uh, ageing. Um, uh, when uh, a much more productive approach would be to truly integrate the positives and the benefits that we have uh, from harnessing uh, everything different generations have to offer and intergenerational interactions. So it's really great that we're going to be looking in this great lecture uh, with not just one expert, which we've often done one of these great lectures with one expert. Today we've got two experts who are taking really different approaches uh, to see what innovative uh, solutions we can uh, bring to these challenges. Carol Rogers is going to be joining us from the National Museums Liverpool and she's going to be talking about uh, a really fantastic innovative approach they took to harnessing tech to aid um, intergenerational uh, and uh, uh, caregiver um, or elder individual conversations uh, through a project called House of uh, Memories. But we also have Dr. Mine Olu uh, from University College London, who is going to be sharing some of her research and the lessons that they have learnt from that. Um, uh, in September 2020, National Museums Liverpool, the National Heritage Board in Singapore and the British Council here launched a Singapore version of a House of Memories app. And it was my pleasure to be to hear early on that this is what we hope to do uh, when National Museums Liverpool visited Singapore in 2019 and then to be there at the moment of launch. Um, the House of Memories app is an adaptation of something that was developed by the National Museum uh, of Liverpool um, uh, and it, it's intended to support people living with dementia and their carers but I think as you may hear from Carol some of the benefits that we have found through using the House of Memories apps aren't confined simply um, to uh, people living with dementia. I think we found all kinds of benefits uh, from this app, which focuses on prompting intergenerational uh, conversations around particular memories. Carol, it's absolutely fantastic to have you back with us today. And I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, what you found uh, since the launch and how House of Memories has gone on to develop. And Dr. Olu, it's going to be wonderful to hear you talk about Celebrage. Uh, that is something I really <laughs> aspire to do myself. Um, and I think there's a, a real keen interest to hear about what you have been uh, working on at University College London. I'm going to hand back to Sarah, who's going to do the formal introductions to both of those. And then uh, I think we need to get on to hearing from the experts. Thank you, Sarah. 
Thank you so much, Cara, for highlighting the importance of reframing in a positive way aging. Um, so in line with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce our preliminary speaker, the wonderful founder and director of the award-winning museum-led dementia program, Carol Rogers from National Museums Liverpool. Carol, thank you. Hello, Sarah. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be with you here today. Um, thank you for the invitation. And um, I'm, I'm just going to speak for a couple of minutes about House of Memories. Um, but I'm really uh, similar to Carla. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted to to hear from uh, Dr. Minnie Olu about the work that's taking place, the research that's underway to look at how we can encourage cross sector innovation to enable everyone to age well and live well. And as Cara referred to, um, this is something that's very close to my heart. Um, as an organisation, we have developed the House of Memories programme um, in, in, in across the UK, but also um, in Singapore. And, and, and what we found from that initiative is that um, um, contrary to perhaps common beliefs that technology um, um, is beyond us as we grow as we grow older, in fact we found it's quite the opposite. And with the right support and the right engagement, we can in fact uh, in fact work work really positively to enable elders within our community to utilise the new tools that are available for communication. And the My House of Memories app is one just one example of that in terms of how a museum and heritage and arts organisations can work slowly with and um, closely with the healthcare sector to enable um, um, new ways of working and to create new tools and new activities that can live in the heart of somebody's own home through a tablet or can support a group of elders in a residential setting, all with a collective aim to enable conversations and rich connections to people's lives and people's past. Because as we get older, Yes, we have challenges and not dissimilar to yourself, Carla. I've I've crossed I've crossed that vanguard of now being officially older and um, quite a few years ago now. And 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 I juggle that sense of um being um, categorized as older, but still being feeling very young in my heart and in my head. And I want to continue as long as I can and, and as ably as I can to have opportunities to be creative in my in my in, and have a long life and a life lived well and I recognise um, through my work with House of Memories that we as institutions need to create opportunities for engagement to make um, the things that we do more accessible and more um, approachable for, for elders and also not to underestimate that as we grow old and um, we're entering a new chapter in our life where we can still be creative and very engaged and there's a real value to doing that for us ourselves for the wider aging community but also for families and particularly for the younger generation wherein we can find ways um, to connect through digital technology to have new conversations conversations and rich um, discussions and creative outputs. And um, as, as a side link to House of Memories, I just wanted to spend a final minute or two just telling you about um, an offshoot of our programme, which very helpfully the British Council has included a film link in, in the chat and I think in the registration. And this is an initiative that's called the Happy Older People um, in, in Liverpool. And on our journey to develop House of Memories across the world, as, as you know, we're with you in Singapore, we've also been approached quite readily um, um, by older people who aren't di um, diagnosed with dementia but still wanted to find new ways of connecting um, and staying connected um, with the community but also and quite rightly wanted to be empowered and enabled enabled to do that in, on their own terms so the happy older network Happy Older People Network came about to encourage that um, enthusiasm. And we now have 370 members in the network, institutional members from across our city region. And more than 4,000 elders now have participated in the network programme. And very simply, what we're trying to do is to, to enable um, the older communities and neighbourhoods to have access to our resources as a museum and heritage park 
partner, but we've also brought into the network a cross sector of arts providers from across our city. So theatres, cinemas, um, the Philharmonic Orchestra, um, music centres, art centres. We've all come together to try to collaborate so that older people in a neighbourhood setting are aware of what we have in terms of programmes, but also taking our resources out to them. And very briefly, a very exciting development has been um, a programme of work that elders themselves have curated and scripted and performed in the heart of their local community, wherein we are there to support them to achieve that goal. And it's just been so positive. And what it's reminded me of is that we never stop wanting to be creative. Our bodies age, our minds age, things slow down a little bit in life. But actually, as human beings, we want to stay connected with society and with one another. And we need to seize every opportunity we, and we can to do that. So on, on that note, um, I'm, I'm going to pack back, pass back to Sarah, but just to say thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this great uh, knowledge lecture, lecture today. And thank you, Singapore, for being so supportive of House of Memories. We've only just begun working with you and there's much more to come. So stay tuned in. So back to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Carol, for inspiring us with that, that sharing of the fantastic work that you're doing um, in Liverpool. And it is indeed our, our great pleasure to, to partner with you and the National Heritage Board on House of Memories. And we likewise look forward to the exciting initiatives to come. It is now uh, my pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker for today, Dr. Mina Olu, to present her lecture. Dr. Olu is Associate Professor in Pharmaceutics at University College London School of Pharmacy. She is Program Director of UCL's MSc Pharmaceutics course and Co-Chair of the School of Pharmacy's Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. UCL is one of the world's leading multidisciplinary universities. It was the very first university in England to welcome students of any religion and the first to welcome women on equal terms with men. Founded by the Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain in 1842, the UCL School of Pharmacy is very highly rated for its research in pharmacy and pharmaceutical scientists. Dr. Ulu's research interest is in personalized medicine designed for special populations, in particular for older patients. She has published over 87 papers and has been selected as one of the World Economic Forum's Young Scientist Class 2020. Dr. Ulu appeared on TV last year to share her research and presented in the Soapbox Science session this year. She is the founder of Celebrage Innovation Network that aims to celebrate aging by driving innovation and knowledge. Today, Dr. Ulo will examine how negative connotations associated with aging can be replaced with a vision of aging that is about healthier, better empowered and more independent living. So I will now hand over to you, Dr. Ulo. Thank you. Thank you very much for very kind invitation of British uh, Council Singapore to be part of the amazing knowledge uh, is great lecture series. I would like to thank um, British uh, High Commissioner uh, to Singapore, Her Excellency Cara Owen and Dr. Sarah Leonetto for very kind introductions. I would like to thank the amazing British Council Singapore team, uh, Lizzie Badakal, the Head of Education and Amira Osman uh, for the sign line interpretation. I very much appreciate uh, this very kind invitation and it's great pleasure to share the session with Carol Rogers. I very much echo what she has said so far, um, uh, her, her uh, amazing efforts and her team's amazing efforts very much aligns uh, with my research vision. The title of my talk is Celebrating Aging Celebrate. As you can see from the title, it will be a very positive talk about aging and aging population. In this talk, I would like to start with introducing you why we are hearing more about healthy aging and why it has been selected as a research priority globally how knowledge exchange activities can significantly help with exploring ways for supporting us live independently and well as we age. I would like to give you some examples from the UCL School of Pharmacy Research Studies investigating 
tailored medicine formulations to the specific needs of older individuals. And finally, I would like to share uh, some exciting news from UCL Initiatives Age Innovation Hub and Tomorrow's Home. I'm sure you have seen the terms healthy aging, successful aging, aging well, and it has become a research priority globally. What is the reason behind? The main reason is the aging population and the statistics. The number of people aged 60 years and above globally is projected to grow by 38% from 1 billion to 1.4 billion during the next 10 years. So the aging population brings us the responsibility to improve the quality of life for aging population and embracing it as a national and international strategic priority. In UK, Industrial Strategic Grand Challenge mission aims to ensure that people can enjoy at least five extra healthy, independent years of life by 2035. Can we achieve it? Yes, we can achieve it because there is a great advancements in medical and digital health technologies in particular, and these are crucial to deliver on this challenge across the life course. I would like to start with the definition of older adults. You might have thought before, or this might be the first moment you will be thinking about a definition of aging population. Should we define them by a number, 65, 70, 75 years old and above? Or does it bring you the idea of a health-related condition, a specific health decline? or the first thing appears in your mind is the retirement status. Actually, none of these definitions are the correct definition for aging population because it is not correct just to attach a, a, a number to, to an aged person. Uh, the main difficulty for researchers is the heterogeneous population, the differing needs, uh, differing health status of aging population. So, I think the most important point is the correct definition and the need for well-characterized groups for aging population. So it is a false narrative to think all age population is vulnerable or frail. There are many people who are having still a fit status or they may have a, a healthcare related need for a specific condition. So the important thing is to understand their needs carefully and then attach the scientific solution and clinical solutions uh, to their uh, needs. And as a society, what do we think about aging? Unfortunately, majority of the society have some negative thoughts associated with aging. But the reason behind this primarily due to the onset of clinical diseases and their general effect on well-being. However, we can replace these perceived notions with the many positives that could be associated with healthier, better empowered and more independent living. So we are living longer and we can celebrate living longer, we can celebrate aging, but we need to reframe the way we think about aging. And it is possible by continuing our efforts in advancements in research and making sure that we continue innovation, and we continue more and more about knowledge exchange. And in this respect, with this mindset, I have set up the Celebrate Knowledge Exchange Initiative at UCL a year ago. Celebrate is a network which is a central platform for investigators in aging related research at UCL with the aim to become a catalyst for inspiration, new insights, new in thinking, exchange of ideas from different departments. Imagine a room filled with researchers from laws, from ethics, from science, from technology, from engineering, medical, life sciences, and so on, and including the external stakeholders. So the early generation of these ideas from cross-disciplinary perspectives lead us to create innovative projects at the right time for the right needs. And public engagement events also bring UCL-led research and innovations for healthy aging to general public through collaborations. So this is the, uh, the, the mindset between uh, Celebrate and UCL. And we have done a couple of events since last year. Uh, the first one is about the policy engagement because we believe that it is important to continue our uh, conversations with the policymakers. So over 45 academics, charity representatives, uh, policy stakeholders um, attended the policy workshops and we defined some research questions which are high priority uh, to bring better solutions for aging solution, uh, age, sorry, aging population and empowered uh, aging population to help them live healthy and a happier life. 
And we also continued our efforts by running some webinars. That was a novel approach because Celebrate is a knowledge exchange initiative and there's another strong knowledge exchange initiative in UK, which is called UK Spine in the aging discipline. So we actually merge our efforts, our power to talk about the important topics in aging. Unfortunately, older adults may face with multiple disease conditions, multiple clinical conditions, which often brings the need to use multiple medicine, which is known as the term polypharmacy. So this may actually present a challenge for older patients, but it may also bring some solutions to them with the aid of the technological advancements. So it brought us the opportunity to think about these challenges, but how we can address them by bringing the powers of knowledge exchange networks in UK. We also brought the novel idea of online idea generation events attended by academics from various backgrounds, ranging from um, specialists from machine learning, artificial intelligence, computer sciences, but as well as geriatricians, prescribers, nurses, neuropsychologists, people who have experience in dementia research. And it was an amazing opportunity to understand from different disciplines what are the innovative technology to support older adults living with the cognitive impairment. And it enabled us to bring the uh, important research questions to our agenda and make sure that we bring our joint efforts together to bring real impactful solutions to older adults. During the pandemic, uh, we noticed that actually, especially aging population uh, was actually hit with the uh, negative effects of the pandemic. And it actually brought uh, the issues like social isolation online. So we, we thought that it is important to work with the local charities and we collaborated with Age UK London to understand how has COVID-19 pandemic affected older Londoners. And when I say older Londoners, we are talking about a quite diverse population with uh, differing needs from health to housing uh, to, uh, to their needs about like uh, uh, collecting food uh, or uh, socializing. And actually their needs were pronounced during the, the pandemic. So we organized an online focus group uh, in 2020 with the aim to come to a nuanced understanding of the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic had on older Londoners, the support they need going forward and how actually we can inspire the future uh, research in this perspective and really help us to uh, be aware of the negative factors like the digital exclusion, which was a main issue, especially at the uh, start of the pandemic. But are the support factors they found useful, like local networks, telephone helplines, and what are the resilience factors actually they have gained during the, this um, uh, period, and how we can actually maintain some of these resilience factors to uh, help older people to recover uh, from the pandemic. And one of them was actually interesting, the creative activities on online art activities. So it inspired us to talk more and more uh, with uh, different scientists uh, also uh, and different experts from the uh, creative art industries as well. Uh, we organize a day bringing a panel of art experts active in academia, community organizations and institutions for an online discussions on the benefits and challenges of online activities for older adults. And the art activities were ranging from music to visual arts to, to dance. And the outcome of this meeting was actually we learned a lot from the online delivery of the art activities. and. Um, it is not possible to deliver everything online, but actually we may use uh, the, this version of uh, the remote uh, delivery of the art activities to help older people who are mostly uh, at their homes or at residential homes. So we try to learn from the pandemic and we try to understand, you know, what their real needs are and what type of solutions can be maintained to help their well-being. I believe the power of public engagement, meeting with public members of public is amazing because uh, public shares with us, you know, what is important for them, what makes sense in our research activities and what may really makes an impact in their life. I have been supporter of the soapbox science sessions but for bringing the science to public and for uh, numerous uh, years I have been uh, engaged with different activities at UCL. We also would like to define the questions for research into aging 
for older people, but with older people and their carers. And I also believe in the uh, the power of publishing the notes from these uh, public engagement workshops. It is amazing and exciting, of course, to do some science in our laboratories, but I think it is very important to share the key notes that we generate, we co-create with aging population and understand what are their priorities in health and social care research in particular. We also publish work about public engagement works, how to improve medicines for or older people as they are the major users of prescribed medicine. You might have seen we have uh, uh, been prescribed when uh, you know there's a clinical condition that needs uh, treatment, medical treatment and uh, if you only think about the medicine that older people are taking via oral route of administration, they may see different shapes, different colors, uh, capsules, tablets, we call them. But actually, there are other solutions. And uh, this picture is showing an effervescent or a disposable tablet to you. And it is actually still a quite traditional way of delivering the medicine. Because what happens, a solid form is put into a glass of water and it starts disintegrating. So it converses cell from solid form to a liquid form and you may think that there is not a, an amazing you know or exciting thing behind it but actually it makes a real difference in people's life imagine someone who is suffering from developing difficulties and they are taking 10 medicine a day if they are struggling to take the solid form a, a presentation of the medicine in a liquid form makes a big difference in their life and a positively affect to the to their quality of life so this has actually inspired us, you know, what else we can do uh, from our research labs. The other shapes uh, that I have shown you are only possible to manufacture with conventional manufacturing technologies. And we thought that can we make medicine by three-dimensional printing? And three-dimensional printing enabled us to basically compress different shapes ranging from the conventional shapes like a capsule, as you can see on the slide, but also some uh, creative shapes like uh, a, a sphere, uh, a heart shape, a cubic shape, uh, a pentagon and, and a donut shape, which you can see on the second uh, column, which looks like a, 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 a distorted shape, uh, like a donut. Interestingly, when we ask uh, healthy volunteers what they think about the acceptability of different medicine shapes, they said that uh, they found the, the torus shape, this donut looking shape, uh, quite beneficial potentially due to the hole because it helps them to take it from the blister packaging. It helps them uh, to actually uh, hold it with even lower grip strength. And also it helps them to coordinate it in their mouth and set of it easily. And it was actually receiving uh, some positive feedback similar to the traditional shapes in different sizes as well. We also tried, can we basically print different colors to help older people to differentiate different colors? And it was also possible to uh, bring color and different shape by 3D printing. It is quite beneficial to address the physical difficulties like swallowing, identification outside of the packaging, handling. If somebody is unfortunately facing with some cognitive difficulties or diseases, uh, then um, uh, they may have some issues to take their medicine at the right time, uh, in the right way, uh, and comply basically with their medicine, for instance, due to a, a bitter taste. So you can mask the taste by 3D printing. And uh, sometimes we need to change the dose of the medicine due to the uh, clinical condition of the older individual and we can basically have a flexible approach by personalizing the dose at the point of administration by 3D printing and research. People may have different uh, diseases and they may need to use multiple medicine, which is known as the polypharmacy. And as you can see on the slide, we can do layer by layer printing as well. So we can manage to deliver multiple medicine in a single entity. And we can print different shapes in chewable forms as well. So basically, uh, the creation of different dosage forms are possible by different novel manufacturing techniques. Also, my colleagues from UCL School of Pharmacy explored, can we use these printlets instead of tablets for visually impaired patients? The idea was about printing the tablets with braille or moon patterns on the surface, such as printing some letters, reminding the patient the name of the medicine, and medicine identification is done through tactile perception. 
and then they look into basically how these um, actually printlets can be given in an easier format. So basically, by this printing technique, the patient is potentially able to recognize and identify the correct medicine that they need to take, but also they manage these printlets to disintegrate within uh, less than five seconds, basically. So they can disperse in water and take these medicines, or they can take it without uh, actually taking water if they have uh, uh, any any problem with uh, swallowing of the medicine. So these are just, you know, um, some uh, examples that uh, what research can offer, hopefully in the near future, to patients who are having some uh, physical difficulties due to their advanced age. And we also look into different research projects, you know, uh, if we follow up from this, you know, research uh, pipeline, can we actually understand in the laboratory how these uh, medicine forms behave? And we developed with my colleagues from mechanical engineering department, a mechanical oral cavity simulator. In this system, there's a silicon tongue in the lab, and then we have an acrylic palette, and this is basically resembling our mouth, it's like a mouth model, and we can see how the tablet is behaving inside the mouth. For instance, if they are having less saliva due to their aging condition, and can the tablet disintegrate and melt away in their mouth without taking water, for instance, due to the advancements in the formulation design, and how it behaves. You can see on the slide that this is what we observed and measured. And the beauty of the uh, in vitro techniques like this mechanical oral cavity simulator is to bridge the studies between the early stage signs when we are designing different patient-friendly forms of medicine and uh, investigations on human. So we can minimize actually our efforts uh, to make sure that the most promising candidates of uh, the, the research uh, can be tested in clinical trials uh, later on. So we are bringing also cross-disciplinary approaches between pharmaceutical and, and engineering sciences to understand that how we can help uh, older population uh, who are uh, suffering uh, from uh, some difficulties such as uh, swallowing difficulty. And I would like to move to the exciting initiatives uh, at UCL. One of them is the Age Innovation Hub. It takes a novel approach by involving people with lived experience of aging issues and also their carers, frontline healthcare workers as equal partners in creating technologies to help us age healthily. So how they achieve it? They engage these groups uh, and they have piloted a new approach to crowdsourcing ideas about real, practical problems and engage with UCL researchers in delivering solutions at early stage. They have defined some challenge areas ranging from building social communities to creating health environments, staying active and supporting people with uh, health concerns coming with age. And they develop how over 600 interactions generated across these challenges. They have four stages in their timelines and plans, and uh, they are reaching to the research stage. So basically, it has started with um, uh, presenting these challenges to the public to gather insight from everyone, including all people, charities, healthcare workers who have been seeing these issues on a daily basis. And then these ideas have been presented to an interdisciplinary expert panel to evaluate each challenge area. And then the uh, most promising actually uh, ideas for the high priority uh, needs uh, are planned to be published on a report for ongoing engagement with the participants, but they will also start the research uh, actually arm by selecting some of these ideas uh, to be uh, actually uh, uh, reach the research labs of, of the of the university. So in this respect, the idea is co-production of research. There's a funding call to seed fund technology solutions, which are identified through Age Innovation Hub, and the focus on an innovative co-creation approach to the development of research with UCL academics. This is really exciting us because it doesn't necessarily need to start only with the uh, academicians, only with the, the scientists, researchers, but actually bringing people who are facing with these difficulties on a daily basis shows clinicians, uh, scientists, that what is the most important issues in um, actually responding to the healthcare related needs of aging population and how we can basically co-produce training, support and uh, research solutions uh, to these needs. There's another exciting project, um, uh, which is tomorrow's home 2050, and it uses space to invite the Age Innovation Hub community to explore their ideas further and to encourage potential matchmaking between UCL's engineers and external community audiences.
So the tomorrow's Home 2050 is visions of home care technologies. It's a recipient of the Royal Academy of Engineering's prestigious Ingenious Award for Public Engagement. It is by UCS Institute of Healthcare Engineering in partnership with the Design and Engagement Specialist, the Liminal Space and Museum of Home in London. Tomorrow's home is an immersive exhibition space where the home of the future in 30 years time is brought alive. And in this project, we are really excited because uh, our launch is very soon on 20th of November and it will draw upon leading research from UCL and it playfully imagines how our actually uh, living environments could be designed to help us live independently and well as we age. And also, if you think Earth is our home for, for the, the entire population, how we can support our changing planet. We will explore imaginary health technologies from the toilet that analyzes waste to the doormat that can detect intruders. And we will discuss how we can actually explore these uh, imaginary technologies, how they could become deeply embedded in people's homes. And it is uh, only limited with our actually imaginations and advancements in, in, in science. Imagine a smart meter, uh, basically monitoring your health condition or imagine a room where you can uh, socialize in an entirely convincing online atmosphere where you meet with your friends, you stroll around shopping and uh, you, you basically, you know, uh, visit different places. So there are many things that uh, can be actually uh, happening at home in 2050 and we will explore in particular how the engineering technologies can enable this. And we will also equip these uh, immersive exhibition installation space with some uh, online conversations and workshops to meet with the public and exchange ideas in this space. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, thank UCL Faculty of Life Sciences and UCL School of Pharmacy uh, for uh, strongly supporting the science in, in, in uh, aging in aging research. Uh, UCL Institute of Health Engineering for their collaboration and their amazing approaches like Age Innovation Help and Tomorrow's Home 2050. My research group uh, for uh, the slides actually I have prepared. They are the, the heroes uh, trying to uh, bring solutions uh, to aging population uh, for their specific needs. Uh, my collaborators, Professor Abdul Basit, Professor Simon Gaysford, Dr. Alvaro Goyenes for the uh, three-dimensional printing projects and Dr. Ben Hansen and Dr. Andrew Redfern for uh, the uh, MAUT model uh, project that we have been working together. Uh, the members of the Celebrate team and of course the participants of the public engagement events, uh, their contribution is uh, high Highly uh, appreciated. And finally, I would like to thank again British Council Singapore uh, and to you all for your very kind interest uh, to my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Olu. That was the most interesting and inspiring lecture. And as you rightly called yourself and your colleagues heroes, because it's just so exciting to think of the significant difference that this work, in particular the 3D printing and the initiatives, will be making in the daily lives of elder people. So thank you so much for that very fascinating sharing. It was a, a privilege to hear that. I would now like to open up the Q&A to Dr. Ulu and Carol. We have a few pre-submitted questions. So um, perhaps I'll start with a question to, to you, Dr. Ulu. Um, could you respond to the question of, can lifelong learning help seniors cope when they are no longer working? Um, Thanks so much, Sarah, for this um, question. And I would like to thank uh, to the person who actually kindly shared uh, this, this query. Uh, I think uh, this is the way forward. Uh, as it says, it's lifelong learning. And I think there is uh, never an age that we should stop learning. Uh, I think it is it is the way we enjoy life. It is uh, giving us the, the, the purpose, actually, for the life. I have read uh, in, in a book that what is the basically formula to happiness. And it says that it is the basically balance approach between the pleasure and uh, the purposefulness in, in life. So when we think about the life lear learning you know, opportunities, it gives us the pleasure because we can do things that we enjoy, like our hobbies. But if there's a reason behind for us doing that, actually, I think it gives us the, the, the best opportunity uh, to be happy, firstly, and learn new things in life. Um, I think the one thing that we need to be careful is about like, you know, how we perceive the lifelong learning, because if it is kind of a compulsory 
hour weekly basis that we need to attend, we may feel different about this life learning, uh, you know, approach and it may feel just a lesson, you know, to or, or, a, or a you know lecture to 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 to, to join to um, forcing ourselves maybe to to learn something new. But if the, the person is in in true means passionate, keen, you know, curious about the subject, and if they haven't had chance to to learn about that uh, topic beforehand, I think it's an amazing opportunity to spend the retirement years on on new things. One uh, thing I think I learned from the pandemic uh, times as well that uh, we started remote teaching, for instance, and uh, uh, there is a certain, I think, ideal and appropriate time for each session. Um, for instance, someone's learning is at maximum level, then uh, we can concentrate on something for 15 to 25 minutes. So if I think these lifelong learning, you know, um, sessions are organized, you know, in a appropriate manner, in a, you know, thoughtful way uh, by maybe spreading, you know, over the week uh, for short sessions in a topic, as I said, the people are interested. I'm sure the, the benefit will be at 100 percent, you know, for an older individual, for a carer, for a young individual. So I, I see the society as a, as a you know, entire society who may benefit from these approaches. Thank you so much, Mine. Um, Carol, would you like to, to comment from your perspective on lifelong learning and how you've seen seniors uh, respond to the app of House of Memory and technology? Yes, thank you. I, 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 I absolutely, my, my experience does resonate with, with Dr. Orlu's in terms of um, creating opportunities and, and providing um, opportunities of choice because we don't all want to continue learning in the same way. And what I've discovered through House of Memories, it's it's more about putting the tools out there that it can enable elders to explore what they want to engage with and how they want to learn. And and, and I believe that technology should should not be seen as um, 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 exclusive to the young. I think elders are absolutely capable and have demonstrated it many times in my work of harnessing technology and um, and those barriers in, uh, to engagement are, are, are often just a, a, an assumption on society's part that somehow that interest and that ability won't be there. And, and I, my experience has demonstrated quite the opposite. So I think one of the things I would say is um, society needs to be open-minded about living well and ageing well and not to be too prescriptive. But the main barriers are around perception of what we can't do to. Aging is seen as a deficit model and I see it completely the opposite to that. I see it as the first time in in, 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 in one's life, if we have been working, we have had family, families, it's time to explore me and who I am about. And ageing gives us the opportunity to do that in a way that perhaps we haven't had earlier on in life. So for me, um, I think technology, engagement, tools and support to grow confidence and um, access are, are absolutely key. Thank you so much, Carol. And I think it really has um, become very clear today uh, how important it is to, to shift perceptions um, around aging going forward um, to secure well-being. Um, now for our next question, um, perhaps we could start with you, Mine. Um, does Alzheimer's affect everybody? Could you respond to that, please? Thanks, Sarah, for uh, for this question, and I would like to again thank uh, for the person who is kindly sharing this uh, question with us. Um, unfortunately, uh, the numbers uh, are quite high when we think about the, the family of the neurodegenerative diseases we call, and it may you know range from dementia-related diseases to Parkinson's disease to Alzheimer's diseases. But um, it is a wrong belief that every individual you know would be affected you know by uh, these type of diseases. Um, I think it is important to follow basically uh, the research in these uh, areas because it's not only about on the you know treatment side of things that's about the pharmacological treatment but it's also around you know the prevention or early diagnosis you know uh, these are uh, the, the areas that actually the researchers are are working on so there are uh, you know uh, for instance interesting studies to uh, basically understand if we can identify the, the patterns of Parkinson's disease by understanding the gastrointestinal microbiota uh, from an individual. So basically 
an intestinal microbiota may give signs uh, for the start of certain diseases like Parkinson's disease. So I think it is important to follow the advancements, you know, in these areas and also um, be aware that, you know, there are different, you know, reasons behind ranging from the genetic, you know, background to the lifestyle that an individual has been exposed to for a long number of years, ranging from exercise to diet. As an individual, not with my researcher head, I believe that it's never late to gain a healthy lifestyle. So uh, we, we, I think, now know better and better every day. We have many resources to understand what are the key features to make a change on our individual lives to live uh, better and more independently at later stage of our lives. So I think the, the, the best thing to, to follow uh, all the news in the science, and uh, it's beautifully described now in lay terms in, in many uh, resources, so we can understand, you know, what are uh, the, the things that we can understand in terms of monitoring these diseases or early diagnosis or preventing these diseases, but also change our uh, lifestyle on a daily basis. Thank you so much, Mina. That's really important to highlight um, the responsibility we each have as individuals um, in being as healthy as we possibly can. Um, Carol, would, would you like to comment on this question around Alzheimer's and on the success you've had around um, non-medical interventions to, to support people living with Alzheimer's? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think um, a bit similar to Mine, I think what I've what I've discovered in my work is um, the journey. No two people diagnosed with Alzheimer's experience it in the same way, and the um, diagnosis, um, as we're seeing now, um, is is at an earlier age than it than 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 perhaps um, um, it was it what it existed as a few years ago. We're seeing people um, coming to the House of Memories program in their mid 40s 50s diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease so um so in in my work which seeks to sit alongside clinical interventions I'm interested in and my work is interested in how to live well with Alzheimer's is that when there is a diagnosis um, and, and the living well is absolutely central to the person who 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 has the condition. But the experience of of Alzheimer's in a family penetrates across the whole family. So for me, it's about supporting the family to live well with Alzheimer's as well, to understand the condition, to be supportive, and 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 to at times to seek that clinical. Um, um, support that they need around lifestyle and 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 um, support that um, um, helps with the condition, but also to look at how engagement and well-being and happiness can still exist if you're diagnosed with with Alzheimer's. Um, and and again, it's seeing the potential that the person has to live well with a condition that I've been most interested with in. And the living well manifests itself in all sorts of different ways in terms of coping mechanisms, communication tools, um, connection with neighbourhoods and society. And House of Memories is just one example of how that is working across the UK and much further afield. So in terms of Alzheimer's, that you know, um, sadly, you know, a clinical cure is not within reach. But as Mine said, you know, the numbers are growing. Um, we're living longer. So some of aging conditions that we see, more of us are going to are, are going to experience. And for me, it's about how do we as a whole society celebrate, appreciate, and value aging and support it in a way that even if you have the condition of um, Alzheimer's, you can still live um, um, a happy and you know um engage life. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, I'm really afraid that um, we now have no more time left for Q&A, so we've come to the end of our session. Um, I, we would love to hear more from both of you, but um, on behalf of the British Council, I would like to offer very sincere thanks um, to Dr. Olo for your incredibly interesting and inspiring sharing today. Thank you so much for giving us all this wonderful knowledge. And um, thank you too to Carol for your inspiring 
sharing about your amazing work at National Museums Liverpool. I'd also like to thank our High Commissioner, Her Excellency Ms. Cara Owen, for her excellent opening remarks, and as well as Amira from the Singapore Association for the Deaf for her excellent interpretation today. So thank you again very much to everyone for joining us for this great lecture. And we look forward to seeing you on the 25th of November for the very relevant last lecture of this year with Professor Wayne Martin from the University of Essex, who will be discussing the challenges faced when dealing with pandemics, such as avoiding discrimination when allocating life-saving medical resources. So we hope you will join us then. Thank you so much again to our wonderful speakers and to you all for joining us today. Thank you and goodbye. HOP Network is a network designed to engage older audiences, individuals, anyone with a vested interest in caring, caring for and, and helping older people across Merseyside. I've been running for about four years now and they are projects that engage older audiences with arts and cultural activity. So organisations are invited to apply for £300 